Hey everybody, welcome back to part two, Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Today we're talking about part two on B vitamins and energy. And so last week when we talked about vitamin B12 and folate and B6 and homocysteine and the interactive pathway on how all that worked and why it was so important for detoxification, for energy, for cleaning the liver, for keeping the liver clean, and, um, and for methylation. This week we're going to cover the other B vitamins. So before we get started, I'd like to dive in or have you dive in and let me know where you're from. So chime in, let me know so I, I can make sure that you can, one, that you can hear me, and, uh, and two, that uh, I'm coming in loud and clear, but also let me know where you're from. And so uh, let's see, here we go. So, okay, looks like we're coming in loud and clear. So again, let me know. Uh, let me know if I'm coming in loud and clear and let me know where you're from. I like to know how many people we're reaching in the world with this powerful message of improving health. So the other thing, if you don't already or if you haven't already, make sure you check us out on youtube.com forward slash glutenology. You can pick up all of the archived shows of the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show on YouTube. You can also go to glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure that you have uh, signed up for our free gluten-free survival guide. This guide, uh, we're just going to send you a bunch of free information that can help you understand how to navigate the gluten-free diet without all the pitfalls and the mistakes that other people commonly make that keep them sick or that keep them in dire straits. So again, let me know where you're from in the world and we will get, we'll get this show rolled out here just in a few minutes. Looks like we've got Tracy from Milwaukee and Marla from Montreal, Canada. Uh, Alan says it sounds awesome. Thanks, Alan. And then uh, we got Tammy from Pennsylvania and Donald, uh, or Donald, <laughs> Donna, sorry, Donald. <laughs> Donna um, from my backyard here and Jennifer from Syracuse and Mary from California and uh, Soon from Texas, Peruse from California, LA, uh, Ramona from Dallas, Texas, we got uh, Cheryl from New Jersey, or North Jersey, and uh, Huda from Katy, Texas, and uh, I don't know how to say that, Ish Pimming, Ish Pinning, uh, is that Minnesota? No, I think that's Michigan. Um, Stephanie's chiming in. Hi, hi, Stephanie. Hope I didn't mangle your town's name too bad. Uh, and then Kim, uh, coming in from San Antonio, Texas. And then Hannah from Milstadt, Illinois, and Aleda from Lima, Peru. Love to see the international community joining the Dr. Osborne Show. And then we've got uh, Teresa from Chicago. So keep chiming in. Uh, you know, don't, don't hesitate. And also, if you've got questions about energy, tonight we're going to be talking about energy, how to improve it, what you can do to have better energy. So if you've got questions, if you struggle with fatigue, if you... If you need me to answer a specific question, make sure you punch those in now. Just put them into your feed, whether you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook. Either feed, we'll try to do our best to get those answered before the end of the show. And, uh, and so let's get started. So again, last week we talked about a few B vitamins, B6 and B12 and folate. We're going to cover the rest today. So we'll kind of draw these out, what you need to know. There's B2, there's B3, there's B5, there's B8, um, as, as some of the others. Oh, and I missed the first one. Then I will write it down here. B1. We'll go out of order. That's okay. It's my whiteboard. We get to make the rules. So, um, and I do all this with no prompting or no telecasters or anything. So this is all just right out of my brain, right? So this is vitamin B1. Vitamin B2, B3, B5, and B8. So again, there are in total eight B vitamins. These are the uh, these are the other five we talked about three last week. So, as it relates to vitamin B1, also known as thiamine, vitamin B1 very very critical for a number of different functions. Actually, one of the things vitamin B1 does is it regulates how we can convert our carbohydrate energy into our carbohydrates like glucose into energy. So. Without vitamin B1, that's very hard to do. Now, vitamin B1 deficiency, actually, it's one of the, the B vitamins that causes disease. When you have a deficiency, there's a name, uh, or there's a condition called beriberi. Beriberi is the disease state of vitamin B1 deficiency. Now, 
because thiamine produces a very potent nerve chemical that your brain needs to communicate, that your heart needs to properly function, this, uh, this berry berry, is, it, it affects that chemical. That chemical, you might have heard of it before, acetylcholine. So without vitamin B1, you cannot make acetylcholine. And without acetylcholine, that can create brain dysfunction. It can also create heart dysfunction. That's why um, when we talk about the disease beriberi itself, it oftentimes we refer to it as wet or dry beriberi. Um, wet beriberi affects your heart. Dry beriberi affects your nervous system. So think of acetylcholine. If you don't produce adequate acetylcholine, if you're trying to work out, you get fatigued much more quickly because acetylcholine is the nerve chemical that allows your nervous system to talk to your muscles about movement. And if you're fatiguing out with acetylcholine, then, then your workout is going to be diminished. Your energy is going to be diminished. But your brain synapses also work off of acetylcholine. And so you can have a brain fog, you can have clouded thinking, or what, what we oftentimes refer to as clouded sensorium, as, as a side effect of vitamin B1 deficiency. It also starts to affect the heart. That's that wet berry berry. And this leads to heart congestion. So if you've ever heard of congestive heart failure, this is what I'm really referring to. Congestive heart failure is actually a form of vitamin B1 deficiency, or it can be. Now, I'm not saying all forms of congestive heart failure are caused by B1 deficiency, but here's what we know. Many people go on diuretic medications. The problem in diuretic medications to control their heart disease, predominantly to control blood pressure. So what happens, a doctor prescribed a blood pressure lowering medication that's a diuretic. Diuretics cause vitamin B1 deficiency. So it's impacted or it's affected by taking blood pressure medicine. And so the blood pressure medicine, which is designed to prevent your risk of dying from heart disease, actually can cause a vitamin B1 deficiency that can lead to congestive heart failure. So there was a study done a number of years ago on, on hypertensive patients who were hospitalized over congestive heart failure. And when they analyzed these patients' vitamin B1 levels, they found that it was an extremely common scenario. And so the authors of the study proposed the question, did the congestive heart failure actually come from prolonged years of treating blood pressure causing vitamin B1 deficiency? So those of you listening, maybe you're on a blood pressure medication and you're really tired all the time. This is one of the common side effects of blood pressure medications. You make sure you go back to your doctor and have them measure your vitamin B1 levels because if you're not monitoring that and you're causing a beriberi or you're causing a heart disease congestive heart failure, remember that can be the cause of lots of fatigue and not just fatigue, but increased risk for other types of problems. What generally happens in later stage congestive heart failure is swelling of the ankles, also oftentimes referred to as edema. So make sure, again, make sure that if you're on a blood pressure medication that you have your doctor monitor your thiamine levels and actually all of your B vitamin levels because as, a, as blood pressure medicines that are diuretics, what do they do? They cause more water excretion. These are water soluble vitamins. B vitamins are water soluble. That means they're lost when you take things that cause more urination. Caffeine is an example of that. For those of you who drink lots of coffee or lots of caffeinated types of teas or eat lots of chocolate with lots of caffeine or drink lots of Red Bull or other types of energy drinks or drink Mountain Dews. Hopefully none of my audience is drinking Mountain Dew. If you are, shame on you. You need to, uh, you need to get a gut check really fast. Okay, let's see here. So yeah, that, that poses another, I wanna just uh, kind of ask a question you know, on that. So those of you who are um, on a blood pressure medication or have been prescribed a blood pressure medication, just type a one in, and that way I know, I know um, how many people that I'm talking to that, are actually, that have actually had this. So back to B1. So again, type a one if you've been put on a blood pressure medication and you're struggling with fatigue. Back to vitamin B1, good, good sources of vitamin B1 in the diet meats and greens, both really good solid sources of vitamin B1, where we tend to see people develop vitamin B1 deficiency. Again, it's excessive diuretics. This is one of the predominant causes. Another one is grain consumption. A lot of people don't realize, we'll draw a line between B1 and B3 here, is uh, vitamin B1 and B3 are actually connected. Um, vitamin B3 deficiency is called pellagra. 
And pellagra and beriberi were responsible for killing about 8,000 people a year. And the reason why that many people were dying from these conditions was grain, grain consumption in the United States. Understand that when you read a box of crackers or bread or cake mix or flour, you'll always see fortified with, and you're gonna always see niacin, which is, which is uh, vitamin B3, it's, it's its other name, niacin. And you'll always see thiamine on those packages. And that's by law. That's because for processed manufacturers who make grain-based products, who process grain-based products, by law have to add B3 and B1 into those grain-based products. It's illegal to sell them without fortifying them because of the deaths that they were causing before food fortification laws occurred in 1943. So many of you weren't around in 1943. You didn't realize that that was even part of our history because uh, because you weren't around, right? So understand that 1943, both of these were mandated that they be added to grain-based products in order for grain-based products to be sold because they were killing people. Again, beriberi was one way people were dying. Pellagra is another way people were dying. What's pellagra? Pellagra is the disease state that's caused by severe niacin or vitamin B3 deficiency. For most people, what does it look like earlier? It can look like acne or inflammation of the skin. So you don't have to, you don't have to be on your death's doorstep or death's bed, right, to, to actually have symptoms of niacin deficiency. So predominantly, you can have bowel dysfunction like loose bowels, diarrhea, you can have inflammation of your skin is another common one, and brain fog and memory lapse is another one. So with vitamin B3, very critical brain fog, brain lapse, diarrhea, as well as skin inflammation are three kind of the hallmark symptoms that we might see in this deficiency. And again, if it gets bad enough, it can actually cause death. It can kill you. So niacin as vitamin B3, if you ever took a biochemistry class, this may ring a bell. If you ever, and if you didn't, then I'm probably um, going to bore you to death. But there's a term in your biochemistry book called NAD. Now, for vitamin B2, that term is FAD. And uh, so NAD is actually vitamin B3. It's just the way that biochemists, when they're teaching this in, in school, it's the way they talk about niacin is as NAD. So if you ever remember picking up your biochemistry textbook and seeing NAD, that was actually niacin. They just maybe didn't mention it. It's one of the unfortunate things about taking biochemistry in school is they don't really teach you how these words like NAD or how these terms are actually vitamins. It would be so much more of an interesting class for so many people if it were taught that way. Unfortunately, it's just not. Okay, let's see here. We got Diane chiming in. Thanks, Diane. I'm, I'm happy to be here. We got Jane from Greenville, South Carolina. Um, so, we, yeah, Jane, we'll talk about fatigue in just a minute. And then Maxine is chiming in. Hello, back to you. We got South Australia, Lynn Johnson, and uh, Alan from Berkey, or wait, Alan DeShane's uh, Water from Berkey. I don't know what that means, but uh, a lot of you taking blood pressure medications or know someone who's taken blood pressure medication that chimed in. Oh, okay, here's a good question off of that. Chris is asking, if you stop taking blood pressure medications, will your levels of B vitamins self-correct? They can, but oftentimes... Uh, oftentimes the support, supplemental support is necessary to really get those levels back up, especially if you started in on a disease state or if you've got GI problems where your gut's damaged and you're not digesting or absorbing quite as well. Let's go back to vitamin B3. So again, I talked about the symptoms of, and the disease. So again, skin inflammation, brain inflammation, and bowel inflammation, right? Skin, bowel, and brain. Now, niacin can also be used. Niacin can also be used. It's one of the few things, even though it's not a drug, it, it's one of the, it's, doctors actually can prescribe niacin um, in, in a higher dose to lower cholesterol. And again, if you watch my series on cholesterol, you'll know that I'm not really all that focused on, on you know, lowering cholesterol, but a lot of doctors will use niacin because it actually lowers total cholesterol, lowers LDL, raises HDL, which is considered to be your good cholesterol, and it can lower triglycerides. 
So it's one of those types of things that can be used if you, if you struggle with the risk factors for what many cardiologists feel like are risk factors for heart disease. Niacin is oftentimes used in lieu of a statin. And if you struggle with statins and you don't want a statin, but you still need to lower your cholesterol or want to lower your cholesterol, this is where it's at. Ask your doctor about niacin and, uh, and, and, and that way you don't have to be forced or, or coerced into using a statin, which can cause muscle damage, liver damage, brain damage, increase your risk of Alzheimer's, and not really reduce your risk of heart disease all that much. Um, niacin, so, so again, niacin can be used to do those things without, you know, without the side effects. Now, one of the things that happens with niacin is people will get a flush reaction. There's different kinds of niacin, but niacin or nicotinic acid will actually cause your skin and your face to flush. So when taking higher doses of it, it kind of works like this. It starts at the top of the head. It's like a tingling, almost like a burning sensation, and it just kind of capes over your whole body down through your toes and goes out. So that can happen with niacin. So if you've ever experienced or heard of a niacin flush, that's kind of what it feels like. They usually go away within about 30 or 45 minutes. The biggest problem with a niacin flush is for some people, if you're out in public and your face is really beat red as a result of a niacin flush, it can be kind of embarrassing for a person. So if you're taking niacin, the best way to do it is take it when you're at home and you're not out in the public eye. Niacin, as far as foods, also found in meats and veggies. So again, it's not so much that people don't get niacin in their food unless they're eating a lot of processed veggies or unless they're eating a lot of processed meats, where again, the nutritional quality and quantity is a lot lower. There was a study done a few years ago, it was cumulative data from 1950s all the way up to 2000 that showed that our crops, that our crops, the way that we grow them in the soil that we grow them in is less nutrient dense. The high dose nitrogen fertilizers that we use cause the crops to grow faster, but there's now less time for them to assimilate nutrition from the soil. So they're actually a lot less, um, they're a lot less loaded with nutrients. And that's one of the reasons why we see more and more deficiencies happening today is that is that the way that these things are farmed and the way that our fruits and vegetables are grown so um but again both b1 and b3 niacin and thiamine you can get from veggies let's talk about vitamin b2 riboflavin now deficiency of riboflavin can cause a number of different problems but some of the main ones it can cause your eyes to become bloodshot so uh, your eyes can dry out and become very bloodshot or very red you can develop something called chelosis, which is chapping of your lips, and you can develop something called angular stomatitis. And this is cracking in the corners of the lips. These are like classic symptoms of vitamin B2 deficiency. So if you struggle with, with these types of symptoms and you don't know why, and a lot of people think they're actually having allergies because the, the itchiness and the dryness of the eyes can get that prolific and the chap of the, the chap, chapping of the lips, which is just what chelosis is, that's what chapping of the lips. Angular stomatitis is cracking in the corners of the lips. So if those things are happening to you, again, think vitamin B2. Now, FAD, I mentioned earlier, just like NAD over here with, with, uh, with niacin, these two B vitamins are two of the most critical B vitamins related to generating energy from carbohydrate. So what happens is a lot of people eat, they overconsume, you know, processed carbs. And it's these processed carbs, if the carbs themselves that you're eating are highly processed, they're probably not containing a lot of vitamin B2 or vitamin B3, but your body still needs B2 and B3 to get the energy from those carbs. So what you're basically doing when you eat processed carbs, processed sugars, like drinking soda would be kind of a classic example of one of the easiest ways to cause a B vitamin deficiency. Anytime you eat calories without nutrient density, you increase how much of your own internal B vitamin storage has to be utilized in order to break that food down and convert it into energy. And so what happens to a lot of people is their nutritional bank account is bankrupt and they keep eating processed sugars, but they don't have the B2 or the B3 to process the sugar. So the sugar actually stays in their bloodstream and it elevates their blood sugar and they're still tired and they still have poor energy because they can't get the sugar out of their blood into their cells to be able to generate energy from it. And this is very classic that this happens with vitamin B2 and vitamin B3, probably two of the most important B vitamins related to the generation of energy. So if you're eating a lot of processed carbs, know that you probably have an issue with vitamin B2 and B3. This is why a lot of people continue to crave sweets 
even though they're eating a lot of sweets, they continue to crave them because their B vitamin bank account is deficient. And uh, in every sweet that you eat that doesn't have B vitamins continues to draw these nutrients out of your tissues and make you more and more deficient, leading to, again, a lot of these symptoms that we talk about, but also crushing fatigue or, or um, even severe fatigue, even though you're eating enough calories, you just don't have the energy to be able to function and do what needs to be done. Okay, let's go back to, somebody's asking is B2 in food, and it absolutely is. Green leafy vegetables are a great source of vitamin B2. Asparagus would be a good example as well. Spinach, chard, kale, uh, green leaf lettuce, all gonna have some B2. Let's see, can it cause very low heart rate? Can what cause, Cherry, um, can what cause a very low heart rate? That's the question I have for you. Um, so clarify for me and I'll answer your question. Okay, let's see here. Oh, we got Wendy from Scotland all the way across the pond. Welcome, Wendy. Um, we got Nancy from New Mexico. Hi, Nancy. Portland, Oregon. Joyce is chiming in. So here's a question. I'm wondering if a deficiency in any of these vitamins could cause a person to start having panic attacks. My father was recently, uh, has recently started having these and wondered if it was possible uh, a vitamin. Yeah, absolutely. Panic and anxiety attacks were pretty notorious and, and, um, and people with B vitamin de deficiency and particularly what we talked about last week, which is vitamin B12 is, is, is highly, highly related to anxiety. It's very, very well known to cause anxiety. B12 and folate both. So if you've got somebody who you know is struggling with panic attacks for no other observable reason, you know, you can thank B12, you can thank folate, which is uh, vitamin B9. Okay, so again, B2, green leafies is a great source. Now, here's the other thing about all these B vitamins. Your best bang for buck on B vitamins is liver. So if you like liver, if you can stomach liver, let's just do a poll. How many of you in the audience like liver? If you like liver, type two in to your, to your feed line. If you hate liver, type three in. Um, but liver's a great, great source for vitamin B3 and also B2 and B1 and B6 and B12 and folate and biotin. So, so liver's a really great source of B vitamins. It's packed with B vitamins, the liver stores. I think of, there's this old rhyme my biochemistry teacher used to say, and it's very simple, it's the liver is the giver. That's part of its job. Most people think of the liver as the detoxifying organ, but the liver stores all of these B vitamins so that when you need them, it can pump them out into your bloodstream when you start getting low. So they'll think of your liver as a giver. And so if you're eating healthy liver, healthy animal liver, you're gonna have access to a lot of great B vitamins from that food alone. Again, bang for buck, liver's a good source. Now what some people, they hate the texture or the taste of liver. So you can take small bits of liver, mix it into soups and stews so that you don't really recognize or notice that it's there. It's a good way to get liver into your kids if they're, if they're like texture, uh, they, they don't like the texture of it. The other way some people will get liver in is through capsules, but it's always better to eat it fresh. Um, capsuled liver can be, can be a good source of B vitamins, but if you can get it fresh, it's gonna be better. Than the, than the capsulated version. Okay. So we're getting a lot of threes, a lot of liver haters, <laughs> a few liver likers. I like that. I like that. Thanks for, thanks for playing a role and chiming in folks. Dry liver purchased as a dog treat, Diane. That's funny. Um, yeah, you know, your dogs, I feed my dogs liver. Actually, we feed them, we feed them organ meats. We get the, we get the, we get it from a company. And, uh, so, if, you know, if you have dogs, I'm not, not, I'm sidetracking here, but if you have dogs and cats, know that they're carnivores and that they're scavengers and that you don't want to feed them grain based dog foods. You'll make them really sick. You'll give them a lot of allergies. You'll make them obese. And, and ultimately it's linked. A lot of that grain based food is linked to cancer in dogs. So your dogs want meat. And so one of the best things you can feed your dogs is tripe, which is the intestine, the intestinal lining. And, uh, and if you can, so if you can get a hold of some tripe, there's a company where I live where they go around to the grass fed farms and they take all the organ meats and the tripe and the things that people generally won't eat. And they actually package it as dog food and we just buy it frozen to feed our dogs. So make sure you're taking care of your dogs as well as yourself, right? They're, if, if you're like me, they're an extension of your family. Um, as a matter of fact, if you love your dog, type in four. Let's see how many dog lovers that we have out here. 
Okay, let's move on. So, vitamin B5, have we used, let's see what color we haven't used. No, we haven't really used the solid green. Okay, vitamin B5. Now, this one's really cool. Um, it's also known as pantothenate. So if you ever see the word like pantothene or pantothenate or pantothenic acid, that's vitamin B5. And you'll oftentimes see this on shampoo. You'll see it's you know fortified with you know with uh, pro B5 or pro vitamin B5. That's pantothene or pantothenate, and that's because B5 is important for healthy hair. It's important for healthy skin. It's important for being able to properly metabolize fat and use those oils to coat your hair, to coat your skin, to protect it. But what it's more most well known for is its nickname, and that is the anti-graying factor or the anti-stress factor. This vitamin actually won a Nobel Prize in medicine of when it was discovered by famous chemist Roger Williams, one of the brightest minds in biochemistry and nutrition ever. He discovered that in lab mice, the brown coats would turn gray when this diet or when this vitamin was deficient or devoid in their diets. And then when he added this back in, uh, their coats would re recolorize back to brown. That's why he named it the anti-graying factor. And if you've ever known somebody who was under chronic stress for a really long period of time and their hair turned gray prematurely, this is one of those things, vitamin B5, because it plays a role in stress control. It's actually one of its most important functions is in your ability to produce cortisol. So cortisol production is necessary. Our adrenal glands by your adrenals produce cortisol and you need vitamin B5. There's actually two nutrients that you need more than any other two, vitamin B5 and vitamin C. You need to produce your own cortisol and that's why people with chronic inflammation oftentimes do really well with these two vitamins as supplements because it helps them produce cortisol. Remember what cortisol does. Cortisol is our natural hormone that fights and, and reduces inflammation for us. So if you don't make adequate quantities of cortisol but you are inflamed, then the inflammation will create more pain and more tissue damage. Cortisol subdues that. You might understand this um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a real world application, whereas a lot of doctors prescribe corticosteroids. They'll do either like an injection, so somebody with shoulder pain, they'll do an injection, or somebody with chronic body pain, they'll give them an oral corticosteroid. These steroids help suppress inflammation, but you make your own steroid to control that inflammation. What happens for a lot of people is they're B5 or vitamin C deficient, so their cortisol, their own internal cortisol production goes down, they become more susceptible to pain and inflammation, then they start going to the doctor, and the doctor starts giving them exogenous or, or drug-based cortisol to make up for what they're not producing. But understand that if you have adequate B5, you should be able to make your own cortisol, at least biochemically speaking, unless you're just eating so much food that's co causing so much inflammation that you, your own adrenal glands can't keep up with the internal production of cortisol to, to, to deal with that inflammation. In essence, if your behaviors are conducive to creating a pro-inflammatory state, then even if you feed yourself good vitamins, the, the, the things that you're doing on the other side that are creating the inflammation are gonna overwhelm your adrenal glands over time and lead to subsequent fatigue of the organ where, where they just can't keep up with the chronic inflammation. And that's, again, that's where the medications come in. The problem with the medications is that they cause bone loss and muscle loss and weight gain and water retention. And you don't want that side effect. You wanna be able to rely on your own and that's where vitamin B5 comes in. Now the, the word pantothenate, that root panto or pantos is a Greek word and it means everywhere. This vitamin is found in every food. So those of you who are thinking, where can I eat more B5 or get more B5? It's in all food. But where people generally don't tend to not eat enough, they tend to have high stress lifestyle, right? And whether the stress, remember there's three forms of stress. There's chemical stress, there's physical stress, and there's emotional stress. And it, stress is one of those, it doesn't matter what, where it's coming from, which type of stress that you're experiencing, it affects you chemically in the same way. So whether you're you know, at a job you hate every day or in an argument with somebody you love all the time and there's a lot of emotional trauma and stress in your life or whether you've got 
uh, chemical inflammation as a result of eating the wrong foods, foods that you're allergic to. Those of you who haven't read No Grain, No Pain, I talk all about that in the book about which foods can create inflammation and, and chemical stress. And then there's physical stress. And this is more, um, more to do with what two kinds of physical stress. One is too little exercise, which is actually a form of physical stress. For example, if you sit down at your desk all day long and you never get up and you never take breaks, that is a physical traumatic stress on the muscles, tendons, and ligaments in your spine and in your back. You're creating huge physical stress imbalances. Those of you who exercise too much, that's the other end of the scale. People who, uh, who overtrain. And so if you've ever heard of overtraining syndrome, this is too much stress. So you can go too little movement or exercise or too much. Either way, they're both physical forms of stress. And again, it doesn't matter. Emotional, chemical, or physical, high stress consistently over time causes vitamin B5 deficiency, not so much lack of it in your diet. The diet's pretty dialed in because B5 is pretty much in most foods. Now, that being said, if you're eating a lot of processed foods, then it's not going to be in, in, a, in a ton of processed foods. So you're not, you know, for example, if you're drinking alcohol every night, if you're using soda as, a, as, a, as your beverage of choice, there are no, there is no B5 at all in those, in those beverages. That's why, they're, that's why they're referred to as some of the worst things that you could do uh, to try to maintain your health. Because again, remember, alcohol is a diuretic, just like caffeine is a diuretic, just like blood pressure medications are a diuretic. So if you're drinking that one glass of wine every night, creating a diuretic effect, you're losing B vitamins, including vitamin B5 on a regular basis, and that can lead to, uh, that can lead to a major issue. And a lot, of, a lot of doctors will say, hey, you know, I, um, I, I, my, my doctor said that drinking a glass of wine every night is actually healthy for me. Um, if you've got a doctor that's told you that, you need to find a new doctor. That's one of the biggest myths, drinking a glass of wine every night. Understand that wine is a ton of sugar with no B vitamins. So you're basically, what I said earlier, is you're drinking an alcoholic beverage that has no B vitamins. It's requiring your body to use its stored B vitamins to process it and deal with it. And it's also, your liver has to cope and your liver has to deal with it. So, so again, um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's one glass of, uh, of wine a night won't hurt. And you're just, you're telling that to yourself or your doctor's telling that to you as a justification. It's actually not a healthy thing to do. Drinking alcohol on a regular basis is not a healthy thing to do. That doesn't mean you can't go out now and again and enjoy a glass of wine. But if you're doing it every night, you've got a problem in terms of, B vitamins, and this is one of the biggest common causes of fatigue that I see is the person who justifies even small amounts of alcohol, four to six ounces of alcohol, but every night consistently, slowly over time, raping their body of their B vitamins, and so they're left in a depleted state. And then what do most people gravitate toward when their energy is low? They gravitate toward caffeine. So they go get that big caffeine burst in the morning, either through coffee or some other type of energy drink. And what does that caffeine do? That caffeine stimulates their adrenal gland to pump out, and not instead of cortisol, it's actually adrenaline. And so adrenaline bypasses the way that you normally produce your energy. It, it bypasses the B vitamin component of how we get to energy, and adrenaline as a chemical overcharges you. It overstimulates your thyroid, it overstimulates your heart. It gives you an artificial source of energy for a short period of time. But again, it doesn't correct the B vitamin deficiencies that are oftentimes at the root for the reason why you're struggling with the fatigue. So we think about the average, at least in America and in many industrial countries, the average kind of lifestyle is, okay, not enough sleep, so you were tired, right? So you wake up, uh, you wake up tired, then you drink caffeine to get energized, which stimulates adrenaline, which can cause B vitamin deficiencies, then you drink more coffee throughout the course of the day. Then when you get home at night after a long day of work, you are still in a kind of go, go, go mode. So you want to slow down. So you self-medicate with alcohol. And then the alcohol works as a diuretic causing B vitamin deficiency. And so now you're even more depleted in B vitamins. And then you go to bed late. You stay up too late. Uh, and, and so then the cycle repeats, you know, ad nauseum, basically it repeats and it repeats and it repeats and you end up basically being addicted to uppers and downers because that's what caffeine is and that's what alcohol is. They're uppers and downers. So, you know, don't kid yourself. Start with truth. If you're struggling with that chronic fatigue and that's what you're doing, then you want to look at this 
and you want to make those lifestyle changes because you can supplement with B vitamins and it's a good idea to do that. I mean, I supplement with B vitamins. It's one of the things in my multivitamin is a B vitamin complex. It's there on purpose. If you've ever, any of those of you who've ever taken ultra nutrients, you're actually taking a multivitamin with a B complex, uh, with a family of B complex vitamins on purpose. I designed it that way on purpose because so many people are so deficient in their B vitamin levels that if we can start supporting those, we can start improving their energy and decrease their dependency on things like caffeine and alcohol to kind of, you know, keep, that keeps them in that cycle of, of basically self impending low energy. So, okay. So we got to, we got to B5. We, we got B8s kind of covered up in there. Let's, let's get to B8 here. So we're gonna drop the layouts. This, yeah, this one's good. So B8 is also known as biotin. And biotin deficiency can cause a lot of energy problems, but really biotin, if you've ever talked to a hairdresser, it's oftentimes referred to as the skin, hair, and nail vitamin. So it's necessary for your skin health, for your hair, and for your fingernails. And so a lot of people with biotin deficiency will have hair loss. It, and hair loss and weak nails, brittle nails or weak nails, um, are two of the big, big symptoms for biotin deficiency. Later stage, the skin will become inflamed and we can actually develop a condition called seborrheic dermatitis. Biotin deficiency is actually one of the more common causes of seborrheic dermatitis. So if you've ever been to your dermatologist because of a skin inflammation problem and they, they diagnosed you with seborrheic dermatitis, you might consider supplemental biotin as part of your, you know, you know part of your strategy for for supporting and helping your skin get healthy again. So biotin, very, very important. Now biotin, there was this period in the 1980s, if those of you who ever watched the movie Rocky, uh, you know, with Sylvester Stallone, the boxer guy, right? So he would, he would, in the movie, he would put these raw eggs into the shake and he'd blend that up with some other stuff and he'd drink the raw eggs. Well, that's one of the things that can actually cause a biotin deficiency is the raw egg. Not the cooked egg, but the raw egg, the egg white, itself has a protein in it that binds biotin and prevents its absorption. So uh, raw eggs are a bad idea for those of you who add raw eggs to foods. You want to consider cooking them if, if you suspect a biotin deficit. Um, but egg is a great source of biotin, but it needs to be cooked egg in, in order for you to be able to get to the biotin. You can also get biotin in other veggies, but most of your biotin, oh, between 40 and 50% of your biotin comes from your microbiota so or your microflora or your probiotics or your um, your gut flora right so you actually produce a lot of your biotin your bacteria actually take the food that you feed them and they give you back they pr produce biotin for you so if you struggle with gut problems gastrointestinal problems if you've been on antibiotics for any long period of time you can actually cause a, a biotin deficiency that can lead to a number of these different symptoms, this hair loss, the skin, the, the nail problems, the dermatitis problems. Biotin deficiency can also cause a problem with fat metabolism. So you have a hard time producing the natural skin oils. Again, this is part of supporting your, your body's ability to protect its own skin. You need biotin to do that, but you also need biotin to metabolize fat and break it down for energy. So those of you that are following a ketogenic diet, if you're not getting adequate biotin in that diet, remember you're using a lot of biotin to generate energy from the fat that you're eating. So you just wanna make sure that you're monitoring, possibly monitoring your biotin if you're following a ketogenic diet long-term. Um, and many people follow the ketogenic diet short-term and then get off of it. But if you're on it, you know, for the long haul, for the stay, check your biotin levels. Uh, because this is a very, very important nutrient. And without it, again, we tend to suffer a number of different health ailments. So. We've got, again, B1, thiamine, B2, which is riboflavin. I don't think I wrote that on the board earlier, but riboflavin. That's actually FAD stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide. That's riboflavin. And then we've got vitamin B3 or niacin. Then we've got pantothenate or vitamin B5. And then we have vitamin B8 or biotin. So those are the other ones that we didn't talk about last time. But all of them are critical for the production of energy through three types of of energy production. We produce energy from our calories, from our fat, from our protein, and from our carbohydrates. And you need these B vitamins as part of the internal metabolic processes or the internal chemical processes 
to be able to break those things down into smaller components so that you can make a substance for energy. ATP is one of the examples. If you ever heard of ATP, adenosine triphosphate is the kind of the currency that your body uses to generate energy. And when that's low, it's not just fatigue, although fatigue can be a side effect, slow healing can be a side effect. Uh, and that really, and if, you're, if you've been struggling with chronic illness for a really long time, not healing can also be a side effect. So you really wanna make sure that you're getting these levels measured. Now, somebody asked me a minute ago, Maggie from Boston, is it okay to take B-complex uh, or take a blood test? It's okay to take B-complex. They're very safe. Let's talk about a couple of the side effects that some people experience when, they, when the B-complex levels are too high. One of the biggest mistakes that we see, so let's talk about mistakes people make when they're taking B vitamins. Number one is taking them after 4 p.m. If you take them too late at night, now this doesn't happen to everybody, but some people it keeps them awake. B vitamins give you energy. If you take them at night and it has that side effect with you, you could be up till midnight trying to fall asleep. So it's best to take your B vitamins earlier in the day, in the morning, and again, maybe at lunch would be more ideal. So sometime before 4 p.m. would be the most ideal if you find that B vitamins energize you to the level or to the extent that you're having a hard time going to sleep at night. So in essence, don't take that big shot of B vitamins right before bedtime. Um, one of the other side effects that can happen is actually, B vitamins are very safe and toxicity level is very, very rare. There, to my knowledge, there's never been a case of a reported death from B vitamins. Now let's think about that for a minute. These are essential. These are crucial for human life. You can't exist without B vitamins. And taking them supplementally has never killed anyone. Now let's look at aspirin. Aspirin is not essential. You don't need it to survive. It kills 13,000 people a year. And a lot of doctors will argue, well, these things are dangerous. Yet out of the other, out of the other hand, they'll be giving you aspirin or giving you a medication that has known toxic side effects. These are very safe. The only caveat or the only really big exception is vitamin B6. Every once in a while, vitamin B6, and this is, this is generally somebody who's got methylation issues in their CBS genes. So if you've had CBS gene testing done where you've had genetic methylation testing done, mutations of CBS can predispose somebody to vitamin B6 toxicity, which generally looks like neuropathy. So if you're taking too much B6, it can, it can actually cause anxiety and it can cause numbness and tingling or burning sensations in the hands and the feet. So just be aware of all the B vitamins. B6 is one that if the dose is too high for too long and you're the right kind of person, it can lead to that type of neuropathy. So if you, if you have never had a neuropathy and you start taking a high dose vitamin B6 complex and you start developing a neuropathy, stop taking the B vitamins and see if it goes away. And if it does, it's probably because vitamin B6 was just too strong for you in that formulation. Okay, good question. Donna, so if you have an injury with inflammation and you don't want to take the prescription anti-inflammatory your doctor prescribed, would extra B5 help with that kind of inflammation? No, I mean, technically yes, but, but if you're already adequate levels of vitamin B5, taking more of it is not necessarily going to be anti-inflammatory. What works really, really well for that though is high dose vitamin C. And so high dose C, five plus grams a day. And especially if you combine that with quercetin, um, and, and, and there's actually a formulation that I'm talking about here, uh, Detox C, if you go to Gluten-Free Society, you, it's very easy if you search it, Detox C. And then uh, another formula that I have is called Inflamashield. Inflamashield is rich, very, very high in quercetin. Actually, these are two things that I, I pretty much take every, after every workout just because I know the workout, if it was strong enough, it's going to create some muscular breakdown and inflammation, and I'm just helping my body prepare for that. So these, if you're trying to battle kind of a chronic injury type of scenario, these would be two that I would suggest. We actually use this formula in very high doses. If we're talking about Inflamashield, which you know, again, you can pick that up at Gluten-Free Society, um, it's, it's six capsules a day plus five grams of vitamin C. We actually use that as a bridge to help people taper their steroid doses. So if somebody's trying to really wean themselves off of steroids, we use that as, an, as a natural 
inflammatory support agent to help them taper their doses down to, and be successful doing it. Otherwise, what can happen if you try to taper your steroid and you're not ready for it and you're not supporting it, your pain can flare up really, really bad and, and, uh, and that can be a problem too. Okay, let's see here. Okay, Katie's asking, are your nutrients good for someone with Hashimoto's? Yeah, I mean, they're good with somebody for any condition, whether you're healthy or whether you're sick. They're just, they're, they're supplemental support. So they're just, they're not designed to replace food. They're not designed to replace bad choices or bad behaviors, but they're good. Uh, they're good for you unless you take them and you don't feel well when you take them, which is one of the rarest things that we see. Uh, very, very rare to see somebody react to a, to a high quality multivitamin. Now, I do see a lot of people that bring me in multivitamins that bring them into my office and they re they're reacting to them, but then when you look at the fillers and the ingredients, it's full of garbage, it's full of grain, hidden grain-based ingredients. So a lot of people don't do well with them for that reason. Steve, biotin is actually B8. I, you're, you're wrong. Uh, I appreciate your feet, your, your coming in, but biotin is vitamin B8, not B7. Uh, Joyce is asking, what is good for depression? Uh, lots of things. One of the best things for depression is is uh, is happiness, right? And I know that sounds kind of kind of silly, but what I mean by that is having fun. A lot of people in today's society have lost connection, and they've they stop doing their hobbies, and they and they just stop having fun. They get so focused on on being serious that they forgot how to have fun. They've lost their hobbies, or they're sucked into. They're, they're sucked into um, to things that aren't relevant or aren't as important and they become depressed as a result of choices. Food can cause depression too. The wrong food, high sugar, high grain-based diets can cause depression. So getting your diet and your lifestyle dialed in, Joyce, I'd really recommend if you haven't already, read No Grain, No Pain. Part of that book is about the pain of depression. So I think that would be a very helpful thing for you to do. All right, let's see here. Somebody's asking, I, and I don't know what they mean by this, but I, I'm, um, I think Kim is asking, how can this affect histamine levels and also MTHFR? Uh, if you're talking, referring to multi, the multivitamin or ultra nutrients, it's not going to affect it in a, in a negative or derogatory way. Uh, it actually, if you have mutations, it just kind of works to help, we, help you with your mutations. Um, why do so many, this is a great question. Kelly's asking, how, why do so many natural sleep aids add vitamin B6? Because vitamin B6 is necessary for tryptophan metabolism. And tryptophan is the amino acid that helps you to make serotonin and melatonin subsequently. So in order to produce serotonin, which is calming, and melatonin, which puts you to sleep, vitamin B6 is a, it's one of its functions. It's, it actually serves as what we call a coenzyme for the generation or the conversion of amino acids into hormones that help relax and, and help you sleep. So you need vitamin B6 for that. So those are added to sleep supplements to make sure that you're getting adequate B6 to help your, your chemistry do those things. Anne's asking, can you get too much B12? Yeah, you can, you know, there's a, there's a universal principle law and that is anything in high enough quantities can become toxic. And that it goes for B vitamins. Now, have we ever seen somebody have severe levels of B12 toxicity? Mm, it's, it's so rare. You'd have to be taking such a high dose. I mean, 15, 20,000 micrograms a day for very, very long periods of time for something like that to show up. So in, unless you have, again, an MTHFR, um, an MTHFR mutation, in which case some people with MTHFR or MTRR mutations don't do as well with higher doses of B12 and folate. Oh, Sherry, thank you so much for, for saying that. She says, um, your book, No Grain, No Pain, helped me get back to normal after being diagnosed with celiac. It's my second Bible. Well, I'm so happy that my book was able to help you. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for chiming in and, and letting me know that. Okay, looks like, I think I got them all taken care of, folks, so we are solid. I think I got through it all tonight. 
So again, we'll be back next week for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Again, if you haven't subscribed, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash glutenology. Make sure you also pick up a copy of our free gluten-free survival guide at glutenfreesociety.org. And uh, make sure too, if you're, if you're not receiving or if you're not being notified when we go live, that you click the tab that says get notified. That way in real time, you can be notified when these live events happen. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we have extra bonus live events I don't want you to miss out on. So also, at the end of the show, we have a special discount for those of you watching who've tuned in and stayed tuned in for the whole show. If you use, we've got a special, and I talked about this last week, it's a special product called hydroxycobalamin. We talked about lowering homocysteine. Well, right now, you can pick, your, you can pick up a bottle if it's something that you feel like might be helpful for you, especially if you've had your homocysteine levels and they're high, uh, if you've had them measured and they're high. Use promo code ENERGY. You go to glutenfreesociety.org and search hydroxycobalamin and use promo code ENERGY and you can save $10 off uh, on trying a bottle of hydroxycobalamin. So I wanted to make sure I let you know about that tonight. So we'll see you next week on Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Have a great evening and happy 4th of July.